Sehr verehrte Damen und Herren, wir stellen fest, dass wir eigentlich hier noch locker eine andere Halle füllen könnten. Das Thema Digitalisierung und digitale Transformationsprozesse scheint dermaßen zu interessieren, dass mir jetzt auch klar wird, warum überall und natürlich auch in der Reisebranche das Thema Digitalisierung 4.0 ein großes Thema ist. Wir widmen uns jetzt in der nächsten Session den internen Prozessen, der Frage, wie führt man Marken künftig? Wie geht man mit dem Kundenservice um, aber auch mit der Interaktion? Welche Vorreiter gibt es und welche guten Beispiele in der Praxis, die Sie vielleicht mit nach Hause nehmen, weiterentwickeln können und zur nächsten ITB wieder mitbringen. Die große Frage heißt, sind wir alle, sind Sie alle digital ready? Die nächste Diskussion beschäftigt sich mit dieser Frage und alle Gäste werden die Frage natürlich mit Ja beantworten, mögen zumindest mit 80 oder 90 Prozent. Es geht also um das große Paradigma Mobile First und wie schaffen wir diese digitale Revolution auch in der Reisebranche umzusetzen? Please welcome Nicholas Hall. He's the founder and CEO from a digital tourism think tank, one of the travel industry's leading experts on destination marketing. We are very proud to have you here. Nick has a lot of knowledge special for that issue. Because he had worked with a hundred of destinations helping to navigate the complexities of the increasingly digital visitor experience. And he's one of the youngest entrepreneurs in the tourism industry, a very famous keynote speaker and an organizer of many leading conferences and roundtables. The stage is yours. Thank You're welcome. You. So. First of all, I should say thank you very much to ITV Berlin for continuing to support us. Uh, you've had the introduction. I think some of those words I may have dropped in there myself, which is why it sounded so amazing. Uh, but thank you very much indeed. We're going to start with a short video, and then we're going to move into our panel. So enjoy. Here at the Digital Tourism Think Tank, we have been working very passionately and very hard on something really exciting, which we're about to launch at DTIC 2015, the Destination Transformation Framework. It's a completely new concept and a completely new model where we're working with destinations worldwide to help them transform and throw away those legacy ways of doing things and be real leaders and innovators for the future. This stems on four pillars, that is governance, funding, innovation and marketing, where we look at each aspect of the organization and look at how completely new disruptive measures are actually changing the whole landscape for this industry. So these four pillars are really key to actually making those changes and seeing real success and actually uh, building and embracing a completely new way of doing things. We've seen the travel industry become hugely disrupted by new players and new ways of doing things. And we believe that rather than tackling that and trying to fight that, it's actually better to embrace that and learn from that, which is exactly what we're doing here. We're also working with destinations at three different stages in their development. So we start at the first stage, get ready, and we work with destinations to understand where they are right now. What is the status quo? What are the opportunities on the landscape for them? And how can they actually tap into those? That's, if you like, doing an audit of their activities to help them understand what they're doing and what they could definitely be doing better and where the low-hanging fruit really lies. We then work with destinations at a middle stage in their development, which is all about the transformation stage, where we help them to put in very concrete action plans, roadmaps, strategies, and help them to understand how they can start to really embrace these different changes and put that onto an actual plan that they can then go ahead and implement. And then at the third level, we work with destinations to succeed. And working with them to succeed is really key because once you've put in place all of those plans and changes, it's important that you then carry it through. This all stems down to building and putting together all of the knowledge and experience that we've had working with hundreds of destinations throughout the whole of Europe, the Middle East and Africa, and learning from the successes, the failures of destinations in doing various different activities, from being innovators with marketing and uh, using new technology to, to really perform and be competitive 
as a destination through to finding completely new ways of recruiting people, building talent within your team, getting fundraising from your partners and building great campaigns which are actually going to make people look at the destination and want to go there. And I think that's very exciting. So that is the pretext for today's panel. Um, I hope you're going to enjoy the discussion that we have. We have a very distinguished panel. So I'd like you to give a very warm round of applause as I introduce our panel and keep clapping so they feel motivated. So first of all, I'd like to invite David Chapman to the stage from WISE, Inga Pazdotir from Promote Iceland, Katrina Suck from Enterprise Estonia, and Terry Scriven from Google. Excellent. You did a very good job. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to start with my first question before we hear the different perspectives from our great panel, which is what does transformation mean to each of you? So first of all, starting with yourself, David. Well, I think um, so long as we understand that digital transformation is here, it isn't going to go away and we embrace it, then we'll all be successful. Great. I think um, if you think about the destination, we also talk about it as a destination transformation, and I think in that sense, cooperation, integration is a part of the digital change. Uh, transformation for me, I think it's mostly about adoption, adopting your needs and uh, adopting yourself to the needs of others. And it's about embracing the rapid changes of consumer behavior, how they're engaging online, and how you need to stimulate and provide engaging content to attract them to your destination. Excellent. So I think that's a, a very good opening to our panel. I'm going to come and join you now. Great. And uh, we've invited each of our panel to uh, just give a few words on what transformation is meaning within your different organizations and how you're seeing this being tackled or tackling it yourself. So I'm going to go uh, straight over to you, David. Just want to say to uh, our audience, do get involved with the discussion. We have a team uh, in the UK, it's the beauty of technology, who are monitoring the conversation and they're sending me everything that you say. So if you do have a question, tweet us at think underscore tourism and use the hashtag ITV2016 and we'll try and get your questions to the panel. So without any further ado, over to you, David. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a few bits and pieces to go through this morning, and I'll try and be as quick as possible so that we can get on to the panel discussion. But I just want to talk to you a little bit about the size of the youth travel market. The UNWTO estimated that there were more than 1.1 billion international arrivals globally in 2015, and travelers aged between 15 and 29 represented approximately 272 million, or 23% of international arrivals. And that generated roughly 275 billion US dollars in tourism receipts in 2014. And historically, the youth travel market has been seen as niche and a niche seg segment of tourism. And many have passed uh, the segment off as being budget. And one of the ways that it is overlooked is when mainstream tourism organizations focus on the older traditional holiday maker. Experiential and educational travel such as cultural exchange, working holidays and study abroad that young people do is often overlooked in travel. Wise Travel Confederation's uh, hallmark study of the youth and student traveller, New Horizons, indicates that over 50% of trips taken by uh, youth and students are trips with a purpose other than a holiday or a vacation. These are trips for study, volunteering, work experience, language learning, au pair and other forms of cultural exchange. Mainstream news and research on the millennial um, traveller market may not take into account the non-leisure travellers that make up a large portion of the youth and student uh, travel market. When you're looking at statistics about millennials and Generation Z or Generation Z, depending on where you come from, just remember that it could be missing half of this market. My aim here today is to try and persuade you to think differently about youth and student travellers. Think of them as trailblazers of travel. Put them at the centre of digital um, strategies um, if you want to innovate. I've got two case studies that I'd like to run through very quickly uh, with you. They're two firsts in the digital domain from Wise Travel Confederation member community. 
These are companies that are getting it right as far as young travellers are concerned. One is Student Universe, winner of the 2015 Global Youth Travel Award for Best Travel Agent, and the other, Top Deck Travel, a runner-up for the Beth Best Youth Travel Tour Operator. The first case is the only flight booking app to feature special student fares, the Flights app from Student Universe. The second case is hashtag Top Deck Snaps Snapchat Travel Show. Believe me, I've been practicing that one for a few days. <laughs> Student University's uh, flight app addresses the need for tailored products that service youth and students' uh, unique travel needs. Top Deck's first Snapchat Travel Show speaks to innovative ways to communicate and inspire travel adventure as well as the mundane uh, via a real yet raw medium that leaves only a memory behind. Uh, Flights is an app that was developed by Student Universe, the world's leading travel booking service for students and youth. So what's so special about it? Well, students do everything from their phone and Flights is the first app to offer exclusive fares for student and youth travellers. We all know mobile is one of the fastest um, chat growing channels in travel, and the case in point, mobile traffic has more than tripled for Student Universe since 2013, and represents roughly 25 to 27% of their overall traffic. Our research has indicated that bookings made via mobile devices within the youth and student segment are rising dramatically over the last three years. Regarding flights, 4% of youth and student travellers told us in 2013 that they'd booked via a mobile device. In 2014, 7% had, so it almost doubled. For accommodation, 6% of youth and student travellers booked via mobile in 2013, 14% in 2014. We also found that mobile traffic for hostels has increased from 13% of their overall web traffic in 2013 to 30% of their web traffic in 2015. Mm -hmm. So what were the lessons learned? A native booking experience offers end-to-end -end bookings in the app without redirection to a mobile site, and that's very important. It brings the ease of a seamless booking experience to the screen of a mobile device without skimping on key information and services. Access to flight booking information across carriers in a single app saves uh, mobile space. Consumer, sorry, customer service uh, direct via app using Wi-Fi is important for those that don't want to use cellular services whilst traveling. Flexible search offers clear and quick visual price comparisons. So has it been a success? Well, since the launch of this new version of the app in May 2015, bookings are up 80% year-on-year. That's comparing the old app to the new. Accommodation bookings will become available later on this year. So moving on to um, Top Deck. How many of you in the audience here use Snapchat? <laughs> Just like a few. <laughs> <laughs> How many know what it is? <laughs> oh, okay, a few more. Top Deck began using um, Snapchat um, as a tool to bin, build brand awareness in the UK. A hurdle Top Deck faced as a relatively little known brand in the UK was communicating the experience of a Top Deck trip. Snapchat appealed as a way to give uh, people a glimpse into the trips using a travel show approach with a presenter sharing interesting facts, images and video during the trip. The first Snapchat travel show was ex executed in conjunction with Think House, a UK-based PR agency, and Jimmy, James Hill, a YouTuber better known as Jimmy 10, sorry, 0010. Or maybe he was 0010. Uh, Snapchat is a growing contender as core social channel for millennials. While Top Jet Top Deck already had an engaged community on Facebook and Instagram, they felt that they could benefit from the intimate nature of Snapchat. Top Deck's audience is 18 to 30-somethings. Their average customer is hovering around the 22 years old, and Snapchat is an increasingly popular social platform for this age group. Top Deck has now run three Snapchat travel shows, and they're, lo they're long gone by now, um, so I can't show them to you, but then that is how Snapchat works. However, I'd like to show you some of the announcements of the first show as made by Jimmy0010. 
Jimmy's YouTube announcement of the first uh, Top Deck travel show had more than 5,000 views in an hour, in an hour, which speaks to the cross-platform approach that utilizes social media influencers in the vlogging space. Snapchat works well for the under 30s because it's immediate, a bit raw, and it disappears after 24 hours. Millennials value experience over possessions, and Snapchat taps into this. They don't need to own the content beyond the limited time that it's available to play. Snapchat, con sorry, Top Deck continues to use Snapchat to share content from the road, but it also um, offers exclusive deals at the same time. So let's just have a quick look at the video. Oh, wow. <laughs> the light in, in this video is unintentionally quite dramatic, so sorry about that. Although it kind of works, because um, I've got a big announcement for you, some exciting news. Boo, get ready, hold on to your hats. If you're not wearing a hat, just hold on to your head. I'm going on an adventure for a week, and you lot are coming with me. Yes, you are. Not literally, obviously, that wouldn't work. I mean, just logistically, it would be a nightmare, getting thousands of people in the same place at the same time, not easy. So, I mean, you're coming with me via the medium of Snapchat because I am going to be the presenter of the world's first Snapchat travel show. Oh, yes. <laughs> you, get the, you get the hang of it. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> Great. So that's a really interesting um, to see, uh, actually, the success uh, that one of your yeah. members is having by uh, taking that decision to really go after the millennial market and using the right tools and the right channels which are emerging very rapidly yep. to, to actually um, to build interest and build awareness about what they do. So, great example. Uh, I'm going to hand straight over to Inga now. Uh, so, Inga, um, you want me to go no, through? No, just no. tell us a little bit about um, what Iceland has been doing. I have to say, we just had your team uh, at our content campus last week and they showed some incredible work. Uh, that really um, was outstanding, especially as a, as a beacon and an example for a destination which um, has definitely gone a long way down the path of transformation. So yeah, tell us exactly. a bit about that. Um, I would like to start to tell you a little bit what Promore Iceland does, because we're not like a typical tourist board, actually. We do both tourism, trade, and foreign direct investment. So we try to um, do a lot of cooperation between the industries in our work. We actually started in 2010, and in 2010, we had a little bit of a volcanic eruption, if you remember correctly, with Eyjafjalla Jökull. I know you know, like that name. And uh, at that time, the tourism industry was in a bit of a crisis. So it was thought that it was a good idea to work together. And the industry and the government and the municipalities actually joined forces under a brand called Inspired by Iceland. And today we do everything for the tourism marketing under that umbrella, and we still work together. And I think uh, part of that is um, one of the reasons why we had, uh, had a really good success for the last few years, to have a joint focus in the work that we do and a joint focus for the country and the marketing and the way we think. And also because if you have the, the industry with you, you have a lot of marketing directors, you have a lot of creative people with you to give you good ideas. What we did at this time as well is that we changed the scope of our work. Um, we actually closed down all offices abroad and we have all people in Iceland now. We also have hired different set of people. We have like peer, uh, um, people that are specialists in PR, people that are specialists in social media, people that are specialists in event planning. So it's not necessarily from the tourism industry, but have special skills. And I think for us on a digital note, this has been a very important uh, part of the way we work. Also, what we have done in the past is that uh, we've always had some kind of a campaign that brings the attention to Iceland and brings uh, out uh, different questions, different themes, different ideas of Iceland. Because as you know, uh, most people come to Iceland because of the nature. But it, it, it has been a lot of discussion in Iceland that we need to put the focus on the culture and the people as well. And I think the, the pow empowerment of people in our marketing strategies has also been very important, as well as probably all of you know about the storytelling part in, that you've been doing. But getting the people to tell the story of Iceland, not the tourist board or promote Iceland, has been a very important part in this. So every year we had a campaign, and in 2011 we started out um, with the focus 
focus on decreasing the seasonality in Iceland, and we got uh, the Icelanders actually to invite to their homes. This is for the big boom of Airbnb and Uber and everything. So at this time, we, we did, people didn't stay with, me, stay with the Icelanders, but they invited them for some kind of activity, to, to go out for a walk with a dog even, or dinner or something like that. The year after, we actually asked the tourists themselves, or the travelers, to rename Iceland, and we used our social media to do that. And safe to say, we had a lot of opinion about the name of Iceland. Um, many people think that we, we have the wrong name, that we should be Greenland or, or something else. Mm -hmm. um, the winning uh, name was actually the Isle of Åland, and we used that through our social media at the time. For the last few years now, we've been sharing the secret of Iceland, and we've been asking the Icelanders to be a part of this. So we were always asking the people to do something with us. And everything that we do has the core from the social media and the ideas. And everything that we do is integrated. We use it for the PR, we use it for the social media, advertisements and everything. So every, every time we're telling the same stories and the same message through everything. Last year, we actually did a fun campaign that was actually only supposed to be for two months, but ended up being for the, last, um, for the whole year, to be honest. Um, the focus that year was uh, getting people to travel further around Iceland, to understand our regions a little bit better. And in this campaign, we, um, we selected seven people from different regions in Iceland called Guðmundur. Uh, Guðmundur is a male's name, but we also have the female name Guðmunda. And our campaign got the name Ask Guðmundur, because um, why ask Google when you can actually ask a human? Mm -hmm. uh, that was the whole. But safe to say, we work very closely with Google, mm -hmm. and we actually have a case study online on this campaign. And I would very much like to show the video shortly, a uh, summary of this campaign from last year. There's no sound. <laughs> I'm Guðmundur. Hi, I'm Guðmundur. Guðmundur? Guðmundur. Guðmundur. In here is 40 degrees. <laughs> Hi, Michael, and thank you for your question. Hi, Mac, and thank you for your question. Hello, Bert, and thank you for your question. <laughs> the place where they shot the uh, Game of Thrones, the intimate moment between Jon Snow and Ygrett. Everybody in Iceland has this sexy accent. Guðmundur and Guðmundar are Icelandic first names. Here is a guitarist of Dima to give you a little example. Welcome to Fortitude. And Timo, good luck with your paper. Himin kvöld sólar ska. Google for my research. If I don't know it, then I call my brother Joey. And if Joey doesn't know it, I call my wife Anna. And if Anna doesn't know it, then I call my friend Yoni. And if Yoni doesn't know it, then nobody knows. <laughs> I think that deserves a round of applause, actually. It's pretty good. <laughs> So if I can just tell you briefly about our new campaign, um, for this year we're actually putting the focus on safe travel and, and responsible behaviour in Iceland. We want people to have a happy travel and um, happy and safe travel in, travels in Iceland. So we created a new campaign that just started now on the 25th of February and already got over 700,000 views on Facebook, uh, on, on the YouTube channels. Um, it's all about getting people to understand the local culture, the local um, things that we do in Iceland. And one of the most popular ones is um, a video called Hot Top Awkwardness. 
because many people experience some difficulties in the hot tubs in Iceland. But this is just to give you a brief of this, but um, I encourage you to go online. We call this campaign the Iceland Academy, and you can actually do courses online. And we got local tutors to teach you how to enjoy the best food, the, to enjoy the best travels, and the... Um, uh, yeah, and the local culture and so on. And there will be more videos online later on, but this is our hero video. If I can just show it briefly and then I'm done. Thank you. My name is Dina. Welcome to Iceland Academy. There are so many amazing things about Iceland. Beautiful nature, wonderful food, arts, culture. And we know that you want to experience it all like a local. Our expert guides will teach you vital things such as how to pack for Iceland, how to have an Icelandic adventure, staying safe, Icelandic spa etiquette. So no matter where you travel, you'll always be happy and relaxed, just like us. you like it some and some great work there yeah, I, I think if I could summarize what I take from that people humor and edginess take some risks yeah. right yeah excellent okay thanks a lot we'll come back to you with some interesting questions on that um, I'm gonna keep uh, on track of time here so I'm gonna hand straight over to Katrina uh, from Enterprise Estonia now we've actually been following Enterprise Estonia uh, quite closely over the last couple of years because um, you've been taking an interesting turn in a slightly different direction. Um, so share a bit more about that with us. Uh, yes, hello. Um, Estonian Tourist Board is currently really going through a true transformation. Uh, first of all, we are uh, changing our structure. Actually, it changed and uh, the new one was enforced on the 1st of Mar March. And so far, we used to be market-based, so we had our target markets, and all, all our activities were really market-based. But now we have decided to be uh, expertise-based or specialized. That means that we have one campaign manager, one communication manager, so everything is more uh, specialized. And at the same time, uh, Estonia is currently also looking for its story, which means that uh, we are looking for a new brand, uh, which means that when Iceland has a really great humorous story to tell, then we currently don't know what our story is. Estonia is a young country and uh, we are trying to find out. So uh, last year we did a campaign called Epic Estonia and it was uh, kind of a first step towards uh, finding our story. We collected the most coolest uh, epic uh, things to do from around Estonia and uh, did a big campaign about them uh, in Sweden. And the idea of collecting these uh, activities is also kind of to tell Estonians what the story is, what to tell. Um, and this is, um, through these uh, new activities, we have also shifted from traditional media to more online. And our new structure is also very digitally oriented, so every job uh, in some way or every sp specialization is connected to um, uh, social media channels. And uh, what we're trying to do is also um, in transforming the channels uh, to use completely new channels. This is an example of our new campaign that we have just uh, launched. It's called uh, Deepest Roots and it's about connecting with your true self in the nature, getting away from the, um, all this digital fuzziness and uh, city life in the, in the nature. And this is Gerli. She's the most uh, famous singer in Estonia. And uh, she is now kind of as used as one of our channels as uh, she has filmed her new music, music videos in Estonia, in Estonian nature and based all her stories on Estonian mythology. So uh, kind of an angle to uh, tell about Estonian nature. And uh, this is another thing we are doing um, with this campaign. This is a visual example of a um, Facebook test that we are launching in April. It is about uh, finding out which uh, fairy or sprite you are from uh, Estonian mythology. So this is an example of uh, how to mix uh, traditions with uh, modern channels and how to integrate them, how to transform this 
um, more traditional um, stories. And uh, last slide, I would like to show an example of how we are getting also into the stage of letting Estonians tell the story of Estonia. So uh, we are really into new social media channels. We also are using Snapchat. And this is truly, as you said, a raw, very uh, non-pretentious channel where uh, we have built it up as uh, takeovers where Estonians are telling the story of Estonia. Excellent. Well, that's really interesting. I, I think it's early days um, in, in terms of this new direction. Um, some fantastic imagery there. Uh, I'll be really interested to, to learn a bit more about the results of that um, towards the end of the year. So thanks very much for sharing that. And we'll get back to the discussion on uh, your new organizational structure in just a moment. So over to you, Terry, to talk about uh, some big announcements from Google yesterday. Uh, so tell yeah. us a bit more about what that means for, uh, for the whole tourism and destination landscape. Well, um, we've recognized the changing consumer behavior and the, really the predominance of utilizing your mobile, mobile phone. So almost 50% of, of searches for travel happen on a mobile device. Um, and now, as a result of that, you're checking your mobile device 150 times a day. In fact, many of you probably doing so right now. Um, and evaluating what, you know, when you utilize your mobile device in that user journey. We developed a, a new product, but before I get into that, I actually just wanted to showcase a little bit more about that change in consumer behavior and utilizing your mobile device for those micro moments, um, those I want to buy moments, I want to do moments, I want to go moments. Um, so we just have a, a short video um, that brings it to life. This is quite ripe for digital transformation and really recognizing um, the true journey um, that consumers have gone and the uptake that we're seeing in terms of engaging on a mobile device. Um, so we just launched this week a new product. It's called Destinations on Google. You may have seen um, it in the press over the course of the last couple of days. And Oliver Heckman, our VP of Travel, just spoke yesterday on the stage just nearby about that product. Um, it's actually a really exciting experience because it allows you to explore areas of interest, you know, in terms of the destination, um, things to do, and interests in that destination, and links together hotel pricing information as well as flight pricing to understand potential prices to go and to travel to that destination. And you can dive further deep to understand when's the popular time to go, also when's the best time to go from a weather perspective. And it, there's quite a lot of rich content. The YouTube and vi high popular video content is showcased, um, but there's also a relatively high level editorial content to, to talk about that destination. Um, so it's definitely an exciting time. I had another video. I'm not sure. Do we have time just I to quickly? I think we can roll it quickly and then we'll yeah, move to the discussion. Just tell you a little bit more about it. Got some downtime waiting in line for your morning coffee? Why not plan and book your next big trip with destinations on Google? Just tell Google search where you're thinking of heading, add destination or vacation, and you're off. Check out the top spots right from your search results. You can compare prices at a glance and see the next dates when fares and rates are low. 
To personalize your results, just select your dates, who's flying with you, and how much you want to spend or not spend. Your results are automatically updated. Think you found the place? Now you can search and check out popular itineraries from people who have been there, done that. Voila! You're ready to book your dream trip right from Google. Just slide left or right to see estimated trip prices for the next six months as Google compares millions of flights and hotels together in real time. That's it. Planning and booking your vacation is easy. Now all you have to do is pack. That, that really is a game changer, I think. So uh, <laughs> let's move straight over to the discussion then. Uh, thanks for sharing that with You're us, welcome. Terry. Uh, very interesting. I think everybody can also relate there to the micro moments uh, that they they can all kind of relate to on their daily mm -hmm. basis. As you said, everybody's actually, I can see, tweeting and uh, sharing their comments. So do share your comments. If you have any questions, we'll put them to the panel. But um, right away, I want to go straight back to our panel and um, start by asking uh, all of you actually what you think should be defining the uh, DMO's remit today, their core remit, what they should be doing. I think what you've just shown us uh, indicates a very dramatic shift in how we are discovering places, mm -hmm. how we're sharing those experiences, and how we're making decisions to travel. Mm -hmm. So what does this now mean for the destination? Um, so any volunteers? I can volunteer. Go ahead. Sorry. I think it really depends on uh, where, where the destination is at. Like if we take Estonia, then uh, our job is also to help find out what the story is. That's what we're doing currently. So it really depends if the story or if the locals already know what the story is of that destination or if they don't know it yet. Yeah. What has this meant for, for I, I Promote think, Iceland? I think for Promote Iceland, I think everywhere we are visible is important. And everywhere you can find information on about Iceland is amazing. And all opportunities that you have to promote that, it's, it's, it's good. I have to know a little bit more about the, the tool that is get, we, we are getting there. But I think this is an opportunity for the companies and, and to get more visible online. And we've actually we've been working very closely with Google, with our um, partners in Inspired by Iceland for the last, uh, last what, probably two years. And we've seen the um, potentials that we have in working together with um, like Google in this, in this sense. So I think for the future, this is just a really good part in, in getting us all closer together and getting more information online. For us, uh, because you talk about the future, um, for us at Promor Iceland, as I said in the beginning, the, the cooperation with the partners, I think, is vital for a DMO. Because if you're not working with the partners and if you're not trying to get uh, a focus in your marketing work together for the destination, I don't think the DMOs need to exist. But uh, in the case of Promor Iceland, I think this is, and many other destinations, I think it's vital that we know what we stand for, that we know what kind of a story we want to tell, uh, what our obje objectives are. And I think this is the role of, the new role of the DMOs is to have this public-private partnerships and to focus and utilize all of the great opportunities that you have in the digital transformation. <laughs> great, so all, all of this is uh, new, exciting, an yeah. opportunity, uh, a great new uh, platforms and yeah. lots of new platforms to actually get your content out there. And you know, as a destination, you know your product, your, your location better than anyone. You own that content, so provide inspiring, engaging content that will ensure that you are the place when the time to co comes to choose where they want to go on their next holiday or destination, that you are, you are that place. So focus on your product. Um, think about, and I know there's been a, a lot of talk about that being you know, really a key focus. Find opportunities to attract people to your destination and engage with them. So I'd say that's kind of how the role has shifted. Excellent. Any thoughts from you? Yeah, I was going to just pick up from the, 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 the young person and the youth traveller perspective. You know, the, the young people are the trailblazers. They're the people that are very keen to get into new places. And, um, you know, when we look at the, the research that we do, um, we see that the popular cities like Amsterdam and London are actually way down the list, and that's because they've been done. And young people are always looking for new destinations. So, and, and particularly the, the sort of the, the emerging destila destinations, the developing 
developing countries. You know, they're the, they're the countries that actually, if you develop a youth travel product as part of your overall strategy, so that you're, you're making sure that you've got um, a, a good mix of budget accommodation, you've got um, very, very good uh, infrastructure, things like Wi-Fi, make sure there's free Wi-Fi there because the young people will then go and talk about it and they'll spread the word out for you. It becomes a very cheap um, marketing method. Um, but, you know, the, the, the young travellers, we know that the young travellers that go to destination and have a, have a good time in that destination will return and return and return. You know, they'll go back with families, they'll possibly go back later on when they're much older and they've got more money and time to, to travel. So don't, you know, when you're doing your policies, don't, don't miss out the, the, uh, the, the youth traveller. Don't just think tourism, go wider than that. Look at language travel, look at commercial, tra sorry, um, uh, cultural exchange travel and all of those other types of travel and put that into your policy as well. I think you correctly pointed out that the youth market is always, always going to be the market that's driving the change and that's setting the trends and often it's dismissed and I think especially when uh, a, a lot of people have dismissed new channels like Snapchat, they look at the value of this market, they yeah. say, well, it's really low, it's, it's not interesting, it's not serious, but I think it's, it's, they're the early adopters, if you like. They, they, are, they are the early adopters and um, again, they spend more in destination than, than uh, tourists tourists because they stay longer. The, there is less economic leakage in destination because they tend to use local resources. So they'll look for local restaurants, they'll look for local attractions. They won't tend to stay in the chain hotels um, wh where profit tends to be returned to a, a multinational somewhere else. Um, and they do, um, they do trailblaze. And the other thing is, is that the, the youth traveller is often more resistant to problems. So when you see um, unrest or you see um, you know like the Ebola situation last year and those sort of things young travelers will research it they'll look at the risks they'll take the view and they'll potentially still go whereas we've often seen in the more traditional tourism markets Ebola in Africa means that all of Africa is out of bounds to some to some travelers so you've 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 really uh, nicely pointed to the uh, the sort of destination life cycle which happens in any business actually a product life cycle you go up and you also go down <laughs> and uh, I, I think uh, Iceland is a great example of a destination which is still on a very sharp upwards curve but I think in the, in the coming years as you're actually doing right now you have to keep your awareness level high about what you need to be thinking about for the next five to ten years there has been an increase in tourism numbers for Iceland for the last uh, four or five years. And this only starting this year is 33% increase. But our focus is on decreasing the seasonality. So the most increase is in that season. And at the time when we decided to take this focus in our marketing, we didn't have a whole year, um, that's the whole year tourism industry. Like, um, how would you say that, basically? That the, the industry wasn't surviving the whole year around. The focus was always on the summer. But today, we have a whole year around um, industry. And it has changed completely. We have, um, we have, the infrastructure is getting better. The investments, uh, the, we are actually getting investments into the tourism industry. So activities, adventures, new hotels, the tourism industry is in a really really good role at the moment on increasing and we wouldn't really be doing that unless we would have the increase in the winter season basically. So that has been a really good role for, for Iceland for the last few years. But on the other hand, it's always because we're talking about the youth. The youth has been very important for Iceland in many, many years. But it's always good to have the mix as well. And you can't really roll out one target group, I think. You always have to think about the mix and how, because people tend to travel in a different way. And we know that in the consumer behavior, how people are traveling shorter in the winter season, longer in the summer, and so on. And this is just part of what we need to focus on in our, in our marketing in general. And I think for Iceland being on the roll up, I think this is, this is not going to last, this kind of an increase. But people are getting aware of the destination and we will probably peak at one time. But on the other hand, we can be more focused in the way we are targeting our 
target groups now. Now we can say we want to focus on this kind of a, 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 a target group and this mix and so on. And I think this is just a great opportunity for the future and, and many destinations to, to come. And it's great that you have, uh, you have a great oversight of the changes that are happening and then what, where you can develop that yeah. uh, in a different way in the yeah. future. Yeah, basically just one, one thing, quick thing, because in the beginning people thought that because we were putting the focus on the social media a lot, everyone was saying, oh, you're just going to get really young people. The mix hasn't changed. We still have the same mix. We still have the older generation. We still have the young, younger ones. So I think there's a lot of things in this, yeah. Great. Yeah, to br very briefly to add to that. So we've been working with a couple of our tourist boards, so Visit Scotland, for example, on who do they want to attract yes. to Scotland? What are the passion points about Scotland to drive users to come and visit? So thinking about those passion points, those interest areas. And then we did an audience lab with them to dive deep into their audience data, understand what signals do they gather on their website, and also in different spots around um, either their owned, we call them owned or rented sites, so their site or you know, Facebook, Twitter, any of their social networks, and really understand what are you gathering about the audience data, who are your high-valued audiences, and thus how can you better target them, and align your more data-driven targeting to those. And so the Scott Spirit um, is, the, is the campaign that they're just launching now with a bunch of lovely videos around each of those passion points and their aligned social campaigns is really a testament of that. Great, and we have a, a really interesting question from the audience that I think I'll put to you, Katrina. Um, sorry about that. It's, it's from, uh, maybe she can just wave her hand, or he, I think it's a she, Alola Akimoto. Yeah? Yes, uh, you can see. Ah, okay, there. excellent. So the question is, uh, do external influencers still play a collaborative role in this new transformation using local voices? Can I repeat? Do, do, uh, do local, uh, sorry, do external digital influencers still play a collaborative role in the new transformation? Mm. Currently, it's really hard to say what is playing the major role because we are changing so many things at the same time. We are just at the stage of now uh, talking to a younger audience, developing our infrastructure, going to the um, off-season. So there are so many different influencers at the moment, starting from the fact that we are changing the brand or our core messages, uh, what we talk about and how we talk about it and uh, which channels we use for it. So it's really hard to determine what are the major. Okay, we have a, another question for, for you, Terry. Uh, what about experiences? Uh, what things do we see? Are they integrated as part of the Google destination uh, offer that you have now? Yeah, so there's a filter under interest, the interest tab. You can go in and um, filter on what your areas of interest are, so the, of experiences. If you're looking for culture or, like the example with Estonia, nature, um, and, and select what you're interested in, and the results in terms of the popular itineraries and destinations will showcase based on what you, what you filter. Great. So we're actually uh, running out of time already, which is, uh, which is a shame, but it's exciting as well. Yeah. So uh, one question that I'll, I'll just put to all of you for very quick answers. How do we see this shift from many DMOs that still have very top-heavy uh, structures um, and the need to move towards flatter structures and to move from being administrations to creative hubs to if you like, media agencies for their own destination. Mm -hmm. uh, just some quick thoughts on that. Can I actually comment a little bit on, on the Lola's question? Because she was talking about the external part of this. And I think that's maybe part of the answer to this, is that one of the most important things about our destination is the external view. It's not about my opinion about my destination. It's about how the tourists are um, understanding and, and um, experience our destination. So I think for the future, it's very important to, for the DMOs to have a platform for the external view, to be able to, to share what they think about um, the destination, and of course with all other platforms as well. But for the DMOs to be creative in that sense, and, and utilize the, the, the travelers to tell the stories about the destination. I don't really know how you would flatten out everything. We are in a pretty good position at the moment, but of course there's always politics, there's always some complications that all of us have in our promotion, or not the promotion, but in the organizational structure. But I think thinking about the future, 
integrating it more into more of the food sector with the creative industries like I have. I am both responsible for the tourism industry and the creative industry and I think that makes us much more creative for the future. With uh, just a few seconds, I perhaps will just go to Katrina to also give the other destination perspective on this. Uh, so what are your, or your thoughts on that? Mm, yeah, I also think there's a lot of possibility for... I would like to actually come back to the same thought I had about transformation. I think it's mainly about adoption, like adopting yourself to the needs of others and uh, being really creative in the way you do it and uh, integrating the needs of the industry and adopting them to the needs of the tourist visitor. So creativity is really driving what we're doing right now. So that's, uh, that is a new challenge for this. Some, some destinations, uh, not <laughs> yourselves, of course. Um, so I, I've, in the view of keeping uh, on, on trend with things, I've been around ITB and got a few uh, feedback from people around ITB on Snapchat. So let's have a quick look at what others have to say. So today we're asking all the experts we meet in Berlin, what does the future DMO need to do to transform? Let's have a look. So Ashley Surgeon, what does the future DMO need to do to stay relevant? Uh, future DMOs need to create fun, relevant and engaging content um, that's applicable to the digital world. Excellent. Yes. What does destination transformation mean to you? A lot. It changes everything. Okay, I've been told that we don't have uh, too much time. So if you want to see the rest, follow me on Snapchat. It's Nick Hall Travel. Um, this is a beautiful destination, by the way, uh, where we had uh, actually uh, many of you uh, were attending and learning all about content. And I think that one point that I just want to put in is the most valuable thing is to get hands-on, to get really, really in touch and in tune with what you're doing. And we have seen uh, last week at the Digital Tourism Content Campus all of the destinations really, really getting a feel for being how it is to be creative. Even if they're not the ones to produce it, they need to be much more in touch with their destinations and the human aspect. So I'll skip the video. I just want to say thank you to our destination partners, the European Travel Commission and European Cities Marketing, and also our media partners, Surge, and they have a really nice cocktail booth outside, and travel audience as well, uh, who are great partners of ours as well. Finally, I'd just like to invite you all to join us at DTTT Global, where we'll be disrupting the future destination. We'll have some really, really interesting thought leaders from within and outside of our industry. And that's happening on the 21st and 22nd of November. So that just leaves me to say thank you very much to our very distinguished panel. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and insights. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.